Hey, what's going on, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Awaken Life Podcast. Today is a special day. I have a good friend of mine, Matt Schaefer, here as a guest. Matt is a relationship, a women's relationship coach. He's an expert at empowering women so they can truly transform in a huge way all types of relationships, even the relationship with themselves. You know, I've been married for 15 years. The longer I go, the more oblivious I feel in terms of the vast array of knowledge and depth to learning and growing in relationships. So anytime I have the chance to, to talk to Matt, it's uh, really intriguing because Matt, he's like a lot of us. He had a certain life. He was a lawyer and had a certain trajectory. And like a lot of you, he had a spiritual awakening. And then all of a sudden, everything broke down and shit, shit hit the fan. And then from that, his real calling emerged and he became this, this glowing light for women. So Matt, it's an honor and a blessing to have you here. I'm going to pick your brain today, brother, for the sake of my audience. So thank you and welcome. Absolutely, my friend. It's a pleasure to be here and just so cool that, you know, in the very early stages of my spiritual awakening, my dad uh, was like, hey, there's this guy, Victor, on YouTube. You should check him out. You know, he has kind of a similar energy to you. And I was like, oh, yeah, this guy seems awesome. Little did I know <laughs> a couple of <laughs> years later, we'd be hanging out in Austin and do it and recording podcast together. So it's just a blessing yeah. to, you know, be part of the soul fam and to help each other, you know, make the world a better place, man. That's what it's all about. Yes, ex exactly right. Amen to that, Matt. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So I, I want to respect your time, Matt. So I'm going to get into some of these questions that I know are going to help me as well as my mm. audience. Okay. So mm. one of the things I've noticed within myself is as I've gone through an awakening, I've realized that a lot of my um, patterns and like sort of stressful, repetitive cycles and dynamics that my wife and I play out seem to be awfully eerily similar to that of my parents. So how much does your parents and your lineage and your upbringing affect your like current modern relationships, if at all? Yeah, well, you know, there's always that, been that eternal debate, right? Like, are our patterns and our behaviors, is it nature or nurture, you know, that uh, influences the way that we show up in relationship and the way that we create relationships? And the answer is, is actually both. You know, there's there's actually a genetic component, you know, where actually three generations of of the DNA uh, of, of one human being exist within one person. So, you know, within your grandmother, the cells that would eventually become you were yeah, already yeah. that were already present, you know, and those cells store trauma and they store behavior patterns and addictive tendencies and stuff like that. So there is a bit of a genetic component, you know, where we carry with us traits from the people in our lives, you know, that came before us. So that's, that's good stuff to be aware of, especially when it comes to like addictive propensities and stuff like that. And then on top of that, you know, when we are born, we immediately start experiencing and creating a template of what it means to be in relationship from what we experience from our parents and what we experience from the adults in our lives, you know? So whatever dynamic your parents had, whatever energy dynamics they had as masculine and feminine beings, you're continuing, you're experiencing that and you're learning what the roles are of, of mothers and fathers in relationship, how men and women should treat each other from what you see and what you experience from your parents' relationship with each other and the way they treat you. So a lot of times what we don't realize is we're just unconsciously replicating the uh, dynamics of our parents uh, without realizing it, even if we didn't like those dynamics, like say your mother was like a, like a very, you know, like masculine controlling force or, uh, you know, or maybe she was the opposite. Maybe she was very, very, she held herself very small and your dad was like a tyrant, you know? Yeah. Uh, even though you didn't like those patterns in relationship, you may find yourself being a tyrant. If you're a man, you may find yourself being a tyrant in relationship, or as a woman, you might be, might be attracted to a man who's a bully or a man who treats you poorly just because you decided when you were five, this is what men and women do in relationship. So it's super important to be conscious of that so that we can interrupt and create our own patterns in relationship that are actually in alignment with how we want to feel. Okay. So that's, that's kind of like the formula. Number one, awareness, which a lot of us have mm -hmm. a spiritual awakening will kind of give you that light of awareness. But that number two is like, okay, mm -hmm. well, how do I want, how do I prefer to engage with my relationship? What kind of patterns do I want to wire in? And that's like, what do you say? Like the, uh, 
in a very brief nutshell, the way in which we sort of break the cycle and start our new patterns? A hundred percent. Well, awareness without change, awareness without adjustment is actually incredibly painful, right? Because <laughs> like yeah. when we become aware of our patterns, but we don't do anything about them, it just makes them more agonizing, right? But it's, it's important for us to really ask ourselves, okay, there are other ways that we can behave. There are other ways that relationships can function other than what I experienced from my parents and other than maybe the, the toxic relationship cycles that I've had up until now. If I was a divine creator in my own life, which you are, you know, like what would I want my relationships to look and feel like? What would I want my life to look like? How would I want to be treated? You know, if I were able to release all of that conditioning <laughs> that I've had from my childhood, you know, and so right. it really is, that's when things get really exciting, you know, and they also get hard because it's one thing to be aware of a pattern. It's another thing to interrupt and break it. So it's almost like you're breaking an addiction. Because in a lot of ways, like we just get so deeply addicted to, you know, like emulating what we saw growing up that uh, it can be painful at first, but that's why, you know, that's why we do the work. <laughs> the spiritual right. awakening can be painful too, as I'm sure you and everybody who's listening knows. Yeah. And I, I think that works to our advantage um, that the pain is motivation to change. <laughs> Often a lot, oftentimes pain is a lot more of a motivator for change, a lot more effective motivator than the possibility of something greater. People need to feel that the pain is too great. Yeah. You know, uh, before they'll, before they'll be willing to move <laughs> into right. something new and, uh, and that's okay. I don't care what it takes as long as you start moving in the direction yeah. of something new, because there's nothing worse than being stuck in a, in a relationship or a pattern that, that, that doesn't serve you. Mm, right. Right. Awesome. Awesome stuff, Matt. Let me ask you this. Yeah. So in, in addition to this, what are some other, uh, I would say like, what are some like the major relationship blocks that you, as a coach, you've coached, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of women that you've yeah. seen women, you know, going through, what are some of like the most common blocks? Yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest one I see, and again, I've worked with thousands of women around the world on this topic. I mean, the biggest one I see is, is a lack of self-worth. So love like they might have a dream for all you ladies and, and fellas <laughs> listening to this you may have a dream of oh i'd love to be treated this way it'd be wonderful to be in this type of relationship but i don't really deserve that right and so it's important or 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 you know i have to earn the right to be loved i'm not worthy of love just for being who i am you know and that's what i see a lot of women doing is they're constantly you know pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to earn the right to be loved and a lot of times again we just talked about family that comes from family right you had a mother or father or both who continually told you that you needed to be this type of person you needed to get these grades in, in order to get validation, in order to get love. And so you were conditioned like a hamster, you know, like a Pavlovian dog, you know, to just have to work and work and work and work and work to get validation and uh, reinforcement of your own worthiness, you know, and that's a, that's a toxic cycle to be in. Uh, and so it's important to recognize that no matter who you are, no matter what you've gone through, no matter how you were raised, you are worthy of being loved simply because of the fact that you exist. Right. You are worthy of, of, of being in a loving relationship purely because of the fact that you desire it, you know, and, and anything other than that, if you've got some false narrative that you have to earn the right to be loved, that love is a transaction, that you have to give love to get love, that you have to give yourself to get anything back, then you're, you're disempowering yourself and you're setting yourself up to get into toxic codependent relationship cycles because men will take advantage of that. You know, and when women will too, <laughs> depending upon, you know, they will prey on your wounds. Wounded people will prey on your wounds and they will use that as a leverage point to take advantage of you. So you want to be conscious of that and recognize that you don't need to do anything <laughs> in order to receive the sort of relationship that you desire. Like you just get to show up authentically and be true to yourself and be conscious of what you want. That That's the first big one. Yeah. What do you think about that one, Vic? Yeah, right. It's, it's really... Uh... It's interesting because last night I started reading this parenting book. I think it's called uh, Thrivers or Strivers, something like that. Uh -huh. Anyway, the point is this, this person wrote this book. It just came out. He, he actually wrote it during COVID. And mm. he's someone who's gone and, and done seminars. And he's got a lot of a connection with like adolescents. And he says, right now, mm. there's an un truly, it, it's already been a mess. But now there's an unprecedented rate of like of suicide, of depression, mm. anxiety, 
um, just these kids are burnt out trying to desperately meet these ridiculous, ever increasing expectations of the colleges, their mm -hmm. parents. And a lot of them come from very like well-off affluent neighborhoods and they're yeah. waking up at four in the morning for a, a private swim practice. And they're, they're mm. going to bed at midnight cause they have four hours of homework. And, and it's like, mm. so they're, they're striving. They're like, they're doing a, an unnecessary amount of stuff. And in spite of that, they're feeling very empty. They're feeling very depressed. They're not feeling, they're not feeling good about themselves. So it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting you say the lack of self-love is like with the first one you brought up because that seems to be very, a big issue right now with this, 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 this myopic focus on status that seems to have plagued, especially us here in the Western world. So a hundred percent. And it's all rooted in fear. You know, it's all rooted in fear that you won't succeed, fear that you won't be enough, fear that if you don't push your kid to the brink of oblivion, that he's not going to amount to anything, you know, and at the end of the day, what do kids need more than anything? They need to feel loved. They need to feel like they're enough then that their parents create that sense of safety and give them that foundational, you know, belief in themselves that they can do whatever they want and that, you know, they can be whoever they want to be. And I think one of the main ways that we traumatize our kids and set them up for a lifetime of unfulfillment and dysfunctional relationships is by trying to force them to be who we think they should be, you know, mm -hmm. because then they disconnect from their own journey, their own path to truth, you know? And I mean, it's something I'm really grateful for my parents for is that, you know, I've had a wild trajectory, you know, where I became an attorney and then I quit that after three years because I, I was miserable and I owned a restaurant and moved across the country and did that entrepreneurial journey and then had my spiritual awakening and just ended up following around a spiritual healer doing events and stuff for him and social media for about two, three years before I got into coaching. I mean, I've pivoted massively many times in my life and my parents have supported me unconditionally on that journey and really honored my uh my trajectory and so i mean that was very empowering to me you know and i think it's important that you know that's going to help you uh set your kids uh, kids up for better relationships is if you just let them know that they're okay <laughs> just the way that they are and that they're lovable just for yeah who they are. oh that's lovely matt good good for your mom and dad as, as a parent it's not easy sometimes when you see them going off where you can see a pitfall up ahead but like, like you mm -hmm. said, I try my best. Um, and I, I can see where a lot of, a lot of people, unfortunately, weren't given that upbringing and they're, therefore they have that, that big love block. Well, luckily there's people like you out there, Matt, that can hook people up, um, with the transformation that it can allow them to truly feel whole. And then of course, as a result, have a, a new relationship or a new depth of relationship, more harmony, et cetera. Exactly. That's what it's about. And one other thing, one of the other common love blocks that I just need to mention yes. is women defaulting or resting in their masculine energy to create their own safety. So I talk a lot about the concept of polarity and how relationship, you know, it only thrives when there is a balanced polarity between masculine and feminine energy. Like every relationship is a container, right? With a masculine side and a feminine side and for polarity to exist, the masculine energy dominant partner, which just to speak heteronormatively, I'm going to declare that person to be a man, right? This does not always, not always the case, you know, but for heteronormative relationships, the man generally is the masculine energy dominant partner. The woman is the feminine energy dominant partner. Polarity exists when the man spends the majority of his time, his default resting point is on the masculine side of the relational container and the woman, she spends the majority of her time, her resting default point is on the feminine side. And I say default because these energies are fluid. People can switch back and forth, you know, given whatever the situation is, a woman can be in her masculine energy and that's okay for, for a time, right. To, you know, uh, take command of a trip. Maybe you're on with your partner and, and you're going to lead for a little bit and that's wonderful. Right. But at the end of the day, or maybe in, in bed, you know, a woman wants to to take command and spice things up and, and, you know, be a little authoritative in the bedroom. Fantastic. But at the end of that experience, at the end of that, you know, journey adventure, they get to default back to their, to their respective sides of the container. Cause that's where that balanced, you know, attractive magnetic polarity ha occurs between men and women. And the issue is, is that sometimes when women don't feel safe in relationship, because women are craving uh, safety, like they're craving a sense of safety from their masculine partner. And so for whatever reason, if a man isn't fostering that safety, or if a woman just doesn't feel safe because of, you know, trauma and whatever she's gone through in her life, a lot of times women will default into being in their masculine 
So they will want to, they'll put their walls up. They won't be open to connection or vulnerability. They'll want to always be in like super control of everything. And uh, if they're in relationship and they're trying to create their own safety, they're going to end up living on the masculine side of the energetic container, right? Of the relational container, which is extremely emasculating to a man. And a man, rather than uh, trying to fight in that situation or stand up to a woman who's like in her masculine and not feeling safe, a lot of times a man will just become emasculated. He'll just check out. He'll yeah. just check out. And then, you know, the woman is in her masculine, the man is in his feminine. And guess what? Now you have collapsed polarity in the relationship. And eventually that will, uh, that inverted polarity leads to collapsed polarity, which leads to two people breaking up, you know? Yeah. And so it just, it just doesn't work. And if a woman is there in her masculine trying to go out there and date and she's out there being like, oh, well, you know, I've been hurt before men aren't safe, but I'm going to go out there and date, but I'm not going to risk being hurt. I'm not going to put my walls down and I'm going to be constantly looking for any sign that a man is going to hurt me. And I'm going to blast him. If I, if I feel like there's any sign of that, guess what? <laughs> do you think that, do you think that you think that woman's going to be able to foster polarized relationships with, with men? Right, right. So the, the sounds like the key happen. then is they, they need they need to release the trauma. They need to like go through a healing process. Would you say mm -hmm. in order to yes, like, it's one thing to be aware of that, like you said, but it feels like there's like subconscious wounds essentially that are creating this standoffish masculine presence. That some sort of transformation sounds like is in order for them to truly, you know, relax back into their feminine. Is that is that kind of the idea, Matt? A hundred percent. Well, it's letting go of that belief. And again, you know, I do a lot of work with women. I have courses. I have, I have a lot of things that I do are all around helping a woman understand that, you know, these beliefs that she has to create all of her own safety, that the only way that she can, you know, stay in her power is by being this masculine force, uh, that that's, that's a belief that's not supporting her in relationship. It may help her at work. It may help her be successful in her career, which is fantastic. But if she stays in that space in her connections with men, she's never going to be able to create relationship. And so, you know, she doesn't need to create her own safety. There are men out there that will honor and respect and want to foster and create safety with her, co-create mm. that space with her. And so it's not her job to be on an island, you know, like, a, and be living in fear, right? Like love can only exist when we're able to, you know, release that fear and, and step into possibility, you know, step into possibility and be, be courageous with our, with our hearts truly. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautifully said, Matt. And I, I know you mentioned you do, uh, you have courses and coaching. I want to just briefly mention that because I know we're me and Matt are friends, by the way. So I'm aware mm -hmm. that usually once or maybe sometimes twice a year, he opens up this beta coaching program where he invites women in for free to experience mm -hmm. what he's got to offer for three solid weeks of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of guidance, live coaching. And he, he agreed to open it up to you guys. He's not really, you know, he's just been brought on recently, but uh, he said, you guys, you women are welcome to join. So Matt, would you briefly, uh, briefly tell them what is this involved and, and how can they sign up if they wanted, if they want to be a beta tester? Absolutely. Well, we'd love to have y'all come along. Basically, I'm going to be doing a three week uh, beta launch of my course Mastery of Connection, which has served over 10,000 women worldwide. And it's going to be three weeks of uh, live coaching with me and my team of coaches, uh, where we're going to dive deep into your beliefs around love and relationship, help you identify and release any of the beliefs that you know aren't serving you. And we're going to help you identify your attachment style, which is another huge aspect of how you connect in relationship. Basically, the goal of the course is to help you transform the way you connect with yourself and others from the inside out. And you're going to have video lessons, twice weekly group coaching with me for two hours each time, and uh, about 40 hours of live workshops in the third week. So it's an amazing transformational experience. You're going to be in a community with hundreds of women from around the world on Facebook, which is so much fun. And and uh, yeah, it's always a magical journey. So if you want to join us, just uh, click the link. Uh, and uh, Victor, you're going to have a link. You've got your own personal link for people yeah, in your community. Yeah, I'll leave right? my friends, those on YouTube watching, there'll be a link at the very top of the description box. And if you're listening to the podcast, just go to awakeninghelp.com slash connection because it's called Mastery of Connection. And when does this start exactly again, Matt? You might have already mentioned oh. it. Yes. Well, we start August 9th. So it's going to be running August 9th through the 30th. So it's going to be three awesome 
full week. So take the month of August, do the inner work. And no matter if you're single, you're dating, you're in relationship, uh, this will tremendously help you either deepen your existing relationships romantically and otherwise, or put you in a better place to create the sort of relationships that you want. You know, yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had students, you know, heal decades of family trauma <laughs> in this, wow. in this course process. So, I mean, no, basically no matter where you're at, you will get value out of this. I, I promise. So come along. Awesome. It's going to be an amazing journey. And uh, yeah, I, I highly, highly recommend it to anybody who wants to have better relationships and it's absolutely free. All I need, all I would like is uh, feedback and testimonials. If mm. you get, if you have a great experience, that's all I would like. And so I would appreciate Beautiful. those. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Matt. Beautiful, man. Now, mm -hmm. now on that note, you mentioned people in existing relationships. Now I know I read this book a little while ago called the happiness hypothesis. And he mm -hmm. this guy talks about the difference between passionate love and compassionate love. Passionate love is usually right there from the get go. A new relationship is stimulating, thrilling, exciting. There's the passion. Um, mm -hmm. But oftentimes that sort of skyrockets like a, like a high and then it crashes down pretty quickly. And then there's, there's this slow churn, this compassionate love. That's a love that grows slowly from a seed. But as time goes on, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So I think a lot mm -hmm. of people find themselves, uh, the magic has worn off. And me and Patty have gone through that as well, where we've had to be proactive and sort of keeping the fire burning. So is, do you have yes. any tips for people, Matt, who are in existing relationships um, that maybe you're feeling a little bit flat? And they they want yes. to spice it up. Yes, you, you already know where I'm going. Take it away. <laughs> I do. Well, one of the most important things is to recognize that, yeah, when you first connect with somebody, y'all are on the same page, right? You have this level of alignment, you know, and then over time, you know, you, you're, you're journeying together, but you're also journey, journeying as individuals, right? And a lot of times one or both of you will start to like go off in other directions, you know, things start, there, there's distance that starts to be created between the two of you because of the way that you evolve individually right individually and so it's important that as you're evolving and as you're growing that you stay in vulnerable communication because about about the ways that you're changing about the ways that your needs are changing and what you want and because that's the bridge that will bring you back together and a lot of times as people start to fall split apart you know and they start to go in different directions they just assume that it has to be this way and they don't want to have this uncomfortable course correction conversation with their partner around, Hey, just so you know, you know, I, I need something that I'm not getting right now from this relationship. I, I need us to, you know, have, have more physical intimacy, or I need us to spend more quality time together, or, you know, I'm finding myself feeling really disconnected from you a lot of the times. So how can we, how can we change that? How can we rectify that? You know, instead of having those conversations, we just say, we don't want to be uncomfortable. And so the gap just gets greater and greater and greater until you're like two different people. Mm. And then you just end up like strangers living together or you end up in a completely depolarized relationship. So remember, we're just remembering that consistent vulnerable communication between you and your partner about your needs and, and things that are coming up for you is, is the key to sort of like coming back into alignment. Cause you want to be a part, you want to be a team that sort of is able to move together and no matter which way one person, you know, flows the other person is able to flow with them while honoring their own their own process i mean that's i think that's super important <laughs> yeah and and uh and secondarily you know uh i always say like if some if a couple who's maybe been together for a while and they feel like they've sort of like reached that point where they're sort of strangers to each other like they've both deviated out so far is to really reconnect with your with your partner around what was it that drew you together in the first place was it his sense of humor? Was it your beautiful shared, you know, spiritual experiences? Like what was that spark? Because a lot of times we forget, we forget about that spark that, that brought us together with our partner in the first place and that magic that, you know, created that initial connection. And a lot of times it's still there under the surface, just waiting to be sort of like unlocked and, and, and reconnected with. Does that make sense, Vic? And, and what have yeah. been your what have been what have been your ways that you've sort of done this yourself? I'd love to hear that because you guys definitely still have a spicy relationship <laughs> after 15 years. Yeah, it, it's funny. The, the way we did it, Matt, is precisely what you explained. You know, me and Patty, mm -hmm. we were sort of this when we first met, we spent almost we, no time apart. We went for like years without <laughs> spending a single night away from each other, which is it sounds lovely. But we developed this almost 
codependent sort of attachment to each other for a while. And then, you know, we had children and Patty mm -hmm. was always home with the kids. And so it maintained for quite a long time. But as the kids have been getting older, Patty's been coming into her purpose and I've been coming into my purpose. We've been doing other projects. You know, she just mm -hmm. got back from Costa Rica. She was there a whole week as an example. Five years ago, that would have been like unheard of. So my point is yeah. we started Patty found her passion and that was, it made us feel like we were like two birds leaving the cage. And it <laughs> felt that way. It felt like there was a, there was certainly a distance. We are both sort of really more preoccupied with our mission. Also our children, but not so much each other. And exactly as you said, Matt, what, what really had to happen and did happen multiple times were those very vulnerable, uncomfortable, perfect words, <laughs> conversations that really it's, it's hard for a guy to say, listen, I miss you. I feel like you're drifting away. It, it makes me feel scared. And it's hard for her, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's easy to get resentful in that circumstance or just, or just cold and like apathetic. It's, it's hard mm -hmm. to really get into your heart and, and understand why I'm feeling that way and, and be like, honey, we need to work this out. Or she would do the same thing for me. And we really had to just really get back into our hearts, get out of mm -hmm. our egos, get out of our heads and communicate in a, on, a, on a real, no bullshit, raw level. And then re-nurture that, that spark, which eventually it'll turn back into a flame if you allow it. So we've gone through that a, a few different times, Matt. And without mm. that anchor of communication, we would have probably floated away, honestly. And I can see where people would. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And it, it's nourishing. It's nourishing a living thing. You know, the connection that you have with Patty, the connection that we have in a relationship with each other, it's an organic organism. You know, it's a, it's a thing, you know, that we're either feeding and nourishing or we're starving. And so the energy and the time and the, and the willingness to, to be vulnerable and to get messy and have these conversations, that's what, you know, feeds our relationships and allows them to grow. And so, yeah, it, it, I love what you said about getting out of your ego, you know, because when we're in our egos, we're constantly focused on what, what, what makes us different, what the other person's doing wrong, why we're right. What do I have to do to keep myself safe? Right. Yes. And, and, and if you want to be in a, in a really powerful relationship, you can't be sitting there looking at your partner as a threat or looking at your, as some sort of threat to your safety or your sovereignty or whatever, like y'all got to be on the same team and you have to see each other as, as, as partners, you know, yeah. and rather than see each other as an adversary, <laughs> you know, or something apart from you. So right. uh, it's, it's beautiful that y'all have been able to do that because y'all still have polarity. Anybody who knows Victor and Patty knows that, you know, they have, they still have passion and polarity and there's still that spark and there's still that connection between them, which doesn't happen a lot, you know, with people that have been together 15 years and gone through the, uh, the cycles of, of, of dating, like, you know, like, like you have. Yeah. Right, right on, Matt. And, and you know what? Speaking of that, I have another question that's on that mm -hmm. same vein. Um, a lot of people, you know, they reach out to me, probably especially to you, because they're in a very tumultuous, very up and down kind of chaotic relationship. And now, and I know for me and Patty, we went through quite a bit of that. And mm -hmm. I've learned that it can lead to growth if both partners are willing to really look at themselves, which is not always easy. So yeah. is there like a way to know, like, I also feel like sometimes that's just, it's to an extent to where it's just an example of why it's maybe not the best fit. So where's that? Yeah. How, what's your thoughts on that? How do you know when to just break it off and say, it just accept it or when there's hope and you just have to grow from it? I'd be curious yeah. about your takes. I bet a lot of people are in that situation right now with all the yeah. So yeah, no, the, I I love that man. And yeah, there's a there's a lot. It can look a lot of different ways. But if you're in a roller coaster, an up and down tumultuous relationship cycle, and you feel like that pattern is just this inescapable vortex <laughs> that you're just getting sucked into, it's it's important to look at you know where that's coming from because that's not that's a symptom. That's a symptom of something else. You know, uh, it's a symptom of something deeper. And sometimes, like we talked about earlier, it's a symptom that one or both of you are unconsciously running your parental uh, relationship dynamic pattern. So if your parents had a tumultuous relationship where one or both of you were, uh, one or both of your parents were not stable to be in relationship with, you might be unconsciously modeling that behavior or, or even manufacturing it, you know, baiting out your partner and trying to get them riled up so that you can play out the, the roles that you saw your parents <laughs> have uh, as you were a child, you know? And another big reason that, you know, 
relationships have this up and down roller coaster cycle is because of an attachment style discrepancy. So, you know, one of the things I teach in my course that what's going to start on August 9th is the nature of attachment styles and identifying your attachment style and starting to understand the role it plays in your relationship dynamics. Cause there's basically, there's three ma basic attachment styles, anxious, avoidant, and secure. And half the people in this, and that all, and it all flows from, you know, your parental, you know, experience of attachment when you were a child and people who are secure are balanced. They don't have a lot of, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't either want somebody, they're not constantly trying to pull someone in or push them apart. Secure people are balanced. Whereas anxious attachment style people are much more uh, always trying to pull someone closer because they, they, they need it. They need that closeness all the time. It's a source, source of security and grounding for them. And they're always sort of worried that their partner is going to leave. You know, there's a, an innate fear of abandonment that uh, plays with anxious attachment style partners, whereas avoidant partners uh, have a deep fear a lot of times that, you know, somebody's intimacy is going to steal their freedom that it's a threat to their autonomy. You know, it's going to undermine their business, this, that, and the other. So what happens a lot of times is an anxious partner and an avoidant partner will get into relationship together. Yeah. And that's, and you can imagine how when you have one person who's always afraid that the other person's going to leave and is trying to pull them close and another person who is scared that getting too close is going to, you know, rob them of their freedom, they end up in this yo-yo cycle where the avoidant partner is, you know, drawing somebody in because they like a degree of connection, but the instant they get too close, they're pushing them away. And so the anxious partner is constantly just getting rocked back and forth. Uh, and, 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 and they're, and they're devastated by it. So it's called the anxious avoidant trap. I talk about it a lot in the course and it happens all the time. And so that roller coaster, you know, both partners are thinking, oh my gosh, I love this person so much because I'm feeling so much, I'm feeling so many highs and lows. When in reality, that's not passion. That's not love. That's just a triggering of attachment style. And, and it's a simulation of your wounds. It's a stimulation of your wounds. So it's, it's, it's not healthy <laughs> and uh, it is damaging over time. So if you're able to identify, you know, either of those as the root of your roller coaster, you'll recognize that, you know, this is not the sort of tumultuous relationship that you want to stay in, or there's, there's significant healing that needs to be done to sort of like level it out, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just, just that, like my, my, I would say minimal awareness of, of these different attachment styles has been very helpful for me. You know, luckily I feel blessed that me and Patty have over the, over time become where we lean primarily within a secure attachment. But she yes. certainly has a tendency to be um, avoidant, and I have a tendency to be um, anxious. And I've and and mm -hmm. even like I I sort of dealt with this on a superficial level first, where I just sort of learned and got wise to the fact that okay, I like to have the problem solved right away. I just mm -hmm. thought it was because of how I tick. You want to fix it. And and Patty, she likes to like go cool off, and she just can't. But I yeah. I get so I, I it's like I I can't. Of, I can't escape the anxiety until it's resolved. So I just learned that intellectually and then gave her her space. But it was actually with talking to you not that long ago. So I improved on that on my own a little bit through so much yeah. <laughs> unnecessary drama. But then talking to you the other day at my house, you brought up, well, you said, well, Vic, why do you think you do have that anxious attachment, bro? And I was like, oh. And it brought me back to, my, to a, a high school relationship where I was sort of left abruptly. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt madly in love with this girl. And then she just called me and broke it off. And I explained to Matt, there was like a, a dagger to the chest. So I've mm -hmm. been, I can see now, as of like a week ago, that the root of that has been this, this deep fear that it's all going to end at an instant. And if there's an un unresolved conflict, this, I, I got to fix it. So anyway... Um, just if I would have like known that a long time ago, man, I, I can't even imagine how many fights I would have avoided, how much drama could have been spared. So this is, this is really powerful information, my friend. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Matt. Yeah, man. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that you two, you know, you met in the middle, right? Because here's the deal. Like just because you have anxious or avoidant attachment style, it doesn't mean that you're doomed, that you can never foster a meaningful relationship. If two partners are truly like you and Patty truly have a loving, deep connection and they want to compromise and they're willing to lean in to what they have resistance to, 
you know, like Patty, you know, has a desire to create a bunch of space and to run, you know, and you have this desire to want to push and try to force a solution through right away. If the two of you are able to compromise and you're able to honor Patty's need for a little space and she's, you know, willing to, you know, come back to the table and resolve things in a meaningful, you know, relatively short amount of time. People can work through their attachment style issues and everyone can become more secure as they heal their wounds, you know, and that's yes. one of the things that I do. In, I do in the course. And one of the things I encourage everyone to do is don't think just because you have, you know, a deep attachment style wound, don't think you're doomed because you're not, you know, and we right. can all become more secure and stable in our relationships if we're willing to do the work. And y'all are a beautiful example of yeah. that. Straight up, Matt, because we were a mess for quite a while there. So th I'm glad that you <laughs> highlighted the fact that there is hope. <laughs> There's hope. I yeah. promise. <laughs> now, Matt, let me ask you this. I know there's a lot of people that reach out to me about this, about twin mm -hmm. flame and soulmate relationships. The way I look at it is what I see is a lot of people. And I found this in my own awakening coaching. A lot of, a lot of people are mm -hmm. in a relationship with a very deep spiritual connection. And for a lot of mm -hmm. these folks, it's the first time they've experienced that like spiritual mm -hmm. depth of a relationship. However, yeah. a lot of times these relationships on all other levels are a complete disaster. They're not a good fit for each other. They're, they're like their they're spiritual growth, even though there's that almost like a soul recognition, their spiritual yeah. growth is there's a huge gap. And I know a lot of people, I, I believe, stay in these relationships because of these, these notions of twin flames and soulmates, these definitions <laughs> cast upon an yeah. obviously unideal relationship. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough when you, when there is that, like, no, I know this person at the core. I, I, so it's like, do you have any advice or anything to share upon that? I imagine you got to see that a lot. <laughs> your, yeah, I do. Team. I do. And I mean, there's so much I could say on that. And I think one of the biggest things that's important to recognize is that both with soulmates and twin flames, it's really important to recognize that these people have come into your life divinely as teachers and guides, and they've come into your life for a reason but they haven't necessarily come into your life for eternity to be your lifetime partner, right? Like a phrase I use a lot is people come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And a lot of the suffering that we manufacture for ourselves in relationship is through attachment, is through for, we want to force someone into the box of what the relationship we want. So just because you meet a twin flame, that twin flame isn't necessarily meant to be your life partner in this lifetime. They're meant so that the two of you can help elevate each other, awaken each other to a deeper level and, you know, f flame each other, you know, like be part of that inferno to lift each other higher. But a lot of times your twin flame may be in relationship with someone else, may mm -hmm. not be at the same level of spiritual awakening that you're at, right? But, but they're able to help you elevate to your next level, heal a deep wound, confront some aspect of yourself. They're incredibly important important parts of your journey, but you got to ask yourself, have I become attached to an outcome with this relationship? Have mm -hmm. I become attached to an outcome with this connection to this other person just because it's so deep or it's so profound or whatever? And one of the keys to staying in a evolutionary space and to continue expanding and growing is to practice conscious, you know, non-attachment and, and look at every person that comes into your life as a teacher who's here to play a role but it's not your job to try to force that role to be something that it's not, you know? Yeah. And sometimes the biggest and toughest lessons I have to teach the women that I work with, or I have to help them understand is that no matter what you've gone through with somebody, no matter how beautiful the connection you've shared with them, what you've experienced with them, sometimes the most powerful thing and the most beautiful thing you can do for yourself is to let them go. Yeah. And it's to stop trying to force them to be this, you know, lifelong relationship that they're either not open to, or it's just not in the cards, yep. you know? So, so yeah. take it for what it is, take the growth, take the medicine from the, from the journey that y'all shared together, and then use that moving forward to create even better relationships, you know, and be open to new possibility. Cause there's always something new, you know, waiting for you, uh, down the road. If you're, if you're open to it. <laughs> Absolutely, Matt. And that's something I, I do see as a follow-up result. Oftentimes when someone does finally let go, either mm -hmm. that person gets the growth they need on their own and they come on back and it's a different ball game or yeah. someone new that's just a much that still has that spiritual connection. We have many soulmates, um, yep. but they're much more of an ideal fit uh, on paper and in their life. So there's just, 
there's the love, the spiritual depth without the chaos, without the insane drama. A little drama is okay. Let's keep it spicy and keep it growing. But yeah. too much can be like, it can be draining. So, but I say that with compassion because I've seen people go through it and it just seems to be very, very hard for these people to let go. I've never been quite in that situation, but uh, mm-hmm. my heart goes out to them. But I think most, most people, if they really are under, vibing with this, they, they know, they know what needs to be done. A hundred percent. Yeah. And my understanding of twin flames is that generally speaking, one, one of the twin flames will be the runner and the other one will be the pursuer. Mm. And a lot of times it's that pursuer that ends up just like, just like how an anxious attachment style person would, you know, they end up suffering tremendously because the other person that they going on. And so they're just not able to meet them there, you know? And so like, if you're a runner, if you're constantly pursuing somebody recognize that, you know, in the relationship that you want to be in, do you, are you constantly needing to be pursuing your partner? Or, or are you chasing someone because you're trying to force them to be something that they're not? Yeah. You know, it's I important say, to stay conscious of that. It is. I always say, look at the evidence. A lot of times people get fixated on seeing who the person could be or oh. sometimes spontaneously for a very yeah. short period of time is. But, but the evidence has to be looked at in a sense objectively. If 95% of the time it's, it's a train wreck. And then you see little glimpses, little moments of clarity. That's, that's usually not enough, not a very hopeful situation, unfortunately. Yeah. But. Don't commit to someone's potential commit to who they yes. are. Right you, on brother. You, yeah. you gotta like, you gotta, when, when I like to say with men, you know, who they are is demonstrated by their consistent behavior over time. Yeah. So like what it. their words are, I don't put a ton of weight on that. You know, their behavior every now and again, fantastic. Don't put a lot of weight on that. It's the consistent behavior over time. Give it three, four, five, six months. And then ask yourself, who has this person showed themselves to be to me? Yeah. Right. Like not what have they said, not what, not what are they saying they're going to be or, or, or what you, what you, what you, what you hope they become, but who are they based upon their patterns of behavior? That's how you really get a sense of, you know, the character of that person and what, if the dynamic that you have with them, is it healthy or not? Is it elevating you or is it bringing you down? Yes. Because you want to be with someone who's, you know, uh, a stable base for you to expand rather than someone who's so tumultuous or dysfunctional that they end up breaking you down and tearing you down. That's not the kind of relationship that's going to serve you long term. Yeah. And the one good thing is I think a lot of times those relationships are there to expose perhaps some of their deepest relationship trauma. And then, it's, mm-hmm. and then if you deal with it, then that's when you really drastically transform. So my, my question following on that note, Matt, mm. is how do people do it? It seems to, but based on our conversation and my experience and just everything we've talked about that like, like ingrained patterns, relationship trauma seems to be at the root of a lot of the problems people have in all types of relationships. So how do we, how do we let it go fully? How do we heal it? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's really important, you know, and, and this is, again, this is what we do in the course coming up in August 9th is we really look at, you know, what, what patterns am I seeing in my own behavior, in my past relationships, in my present behavior? And, And what are those patterns trying to tell me? What are those patterns trying to tell me about how I think? What are those patterns trying to tell me about my decisions? What are those patterns trying to tell me about the beliefs that I carry around who I am, what what a relationship is, what intimacy with a man is? You know, you kind of got to do a little bit of detective work to get to the root causes because your patterns are the symptoms. You know, your patterns are the symptoms. And so what are those symptoms indicating to you? They're indicating to you how you see yourself, how you see relationship, how you see men. You know, and so you got to get to that foundational part and ask yourself, are the beliefs because a belief is a choice. And that's something that I think a lot of people, a lot of people disempower themselves because they have this, you know, notion that that they've been handed these beliefs, that their parents handed them beliefs, that society has handed them beliefs and that they just have to cling to the beliefs that they're currently living with. And the bottom line is that's not true. You know, uh, your beliefs are very malleable and every belief that you adopt is a choice. So you can choose at any time. Once you identify the beliefs that are no longer serving you, you can choose new beliefs. It may feel hard. It may feel crazy in the beginning. But as you start to operate behaviorally from a different set of beliefs, you start to have new reference experiences, which then start to validate and ingrain the fact, oh, well, you know, I went from believing subconsciously that I wasn't worthy of love to consciously saying, 
I am worthy of deep, profound, fulfilling love. And because I choose to adopt that belief, when I go out on a date with somebody, uh, I'm not going to tolerate any abusive behavior. I'm not going to tolerate anyone who takes me for granted. I'm not going to tolerate anyone who doesn't allow me to own my voice. I'm going to be confident. I'm going to stand in my power. I'm going to be unapologetic about who I am and the value I bring to the table, even if I feel like an imposter at first. And the men that you're going out with are going to see that. They're going to reflect that back to you because every relationship is just a mirror for how you see yourself and for your own beliefs, right? So as you start to have those mirrored back reference experiences, you know, that reinforce this new chosen belief, your, your life starts to transform. So, so I, I mean, I highly, I, I invite all of y'all who are listening, all you ladies who are listening to this, to come along with us and be part of this journey, because, you know, no matter what you've experienced up until now, no matter what your patterns and trauma have been in relationship, no matter how frustrated you may be about your current relationship or the guys that you've experienced up until now, or yourself, you can heal all of it. You can change today by, yeah. by simply choosing a different set of beliefs, releasing the ones that no longer serve you, and then moving forward courageously to, uh, in reference to that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think any, anything is possible. Any change is possible. And each and every person listening to this male or female is worthy of being in a relationship that lights them up. And, and I think we become the best versions of ourselves when we're in that type of relationship an aligned relationship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I was thinking like, as you were talking, Matt, why I feel so fortunate for people that there are people like you helping people. Like, cause I, mm -hmm. I found for myself, like becoming aware of a negative belief, choosing a new one, is easy. Reinforcing it is hard. Usually it's like, there's like the monkey, like the mind, oh, I want a new belief. But then there's yeah. the monkeys are riding an elephant, our body, our, our, our nervous system, where all the patterns are sort of ingrained. And there needs to be a healing or a transformation on that level for real change. And that's, it's, uh, that's where I think people like you come in. That's what happens at your, on your pro during your program is people get to do the work and then experience that this transformation, which sometimes does take uh, some support and some coaching and the support of uh, other women doing it as well. So exactly. it's so beautiful where like what you do and folks, what he does is where that change actually can take place on a very deep cellular level, rather than just getting psyched up from this podcast and saying, Oh, great. And then you, you, your intentions are good. Like the new year's yeah. resolution is going to the gym. I, I know <laughs> I should, but then like the patterns eventually went out unless you actually go through a, a process of transformation. Mm. That's what, that's what Matt's basically offering to you all for free. So again, mm. if you, if you, this resonates and you want to experience this, click down below, there'd be a link right there or awakeninghelp.com slash connection. And thank you, Matt. Thank you for, for offering this to my audience. Thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom, bro. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. It was, it was, it was really good stuff. Super fun, man. It's such a pleasure, bro. It's just so it's such an honor to walk the path with you and to connect with your beautiful audience. It's just, uh, I'm sure they're just a reflection of the amazing energy that, uh, that you bring to the table, my friend. So I'm excited to see all of y'all in the group, in the party that we're going to be starting here in a couple of weeks. And I promise you, Vic, I will take wonderful care of uh, everyone who comes along on this journey with us. And it's just awesome. an honor to, you know, to come with you and to uh, have this conversation, man. It's been a blast. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Lots of love, man. I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Awesome.